When I was going to school, I didn't care much for history, but the older I get, the more I appreciate it. I love listening to older people tell their stories about how they lived, what they did, and where they worked. We lived at different times in history, but we often share similar stories and experiences. After they're gone, it's too late to hear their stories, which is why I was so excited when I found out there was four boxes of historical documents and artifacts stored in the bell tower of this church. Stick around and I'll take you on a little tour. I'm sitting in front of Mount Olive Church in Chicago. The section to my left was built 100 years ago. The section to my right was built in 1927. This behind me is the original bell tower. The bell was removed before my time, but what was found in the bell tower was a historic gold mine. Let's head up there, but first, a quick stop at a display cabinet that has some really cool historic items as well. At the office entrance to the church, there's a display cabinet. Now most people pass by this and pay no attention to the interesting historical items found inside. Like these copper etched printing blocks from the 1920s through the 1940s. I would have loved to see these in action. For now, I can only see the results of these printing blocks used in the publication of some of these old church documents. Like the storefront where the church had its first service on September 30th, 1917. Ten years later, the cornerstone was laid for the new church, the one I'm standing in right now, in 1927. That picture of the church there, it's made from one of those copper plates. Here's a plate from 1942 used for the cover of this program for the 25th anniversary celebration services at the church. Here's the Constitution and bylaws hand typed from 1927. The current Mount Olive Church is no longer Lutheran, but here's a list of the voting members in 1927, which, by the way, could only be men over the age of 21. This is my favorite picture. The Mount Olive baseball team from the 1930s. Get a load of the guy in the top row, second from the right. His name is Kurt Rommel. Do you notice anything strange about him? He must have been the clown of the group. He's the only one who has his uniform on backwards. Now there's a lot more cool things in this cabinet, but we've got to start making our way over to the bell tower. But first, and most importantly, subscribe to Alley Picked. Go on, do it now before you forget. Subscribe to this channel. I'll be here when you get back. Did you do it yet? See, I told you I'd still be here. Now let's head up there. That up there, that's the bell tower. And that's our next stop. There's no steps to get up there, just this ladder. Then I'll have to push open that trap door and slide it to the side. As I said, the bell is long gone, but I imagine it looked something like this when it was in service. There they are. Did I say four boxes? There's actually seven boxes of goodies here. Check this out, old slides back from the 20s, 30s, 40s. We've got books, ledger books from meetings they had back in the 1920s when this church first began. All right, I think it's best if we take this stuff out of here, spread it out, and see what we've got. There's just a ton of cool things that I brought down from the bell tower. It would take months to go through it all. So I took a few days and I wanna show you some of the highlights of the cool historical things I found, including blueprints from the original church design, 
These books are announcements that the pastor made. Every single Sunday is documented from 1917 all the way to 1931. And these, these are lantern slide plates, some of the oldest photographs of the church. There's a lot more here, so let's dig in. These are four books of announcements. As I read this publisher's note, these books are specifically to be used by churches to document all announcements and hymns sung every Sunday. Which is exactly what they did from 1917 to 1932. There are many interesting events documented in these books. Like this announcement entry from October 20th, 1918. This was during the influenza pandemic, also referred to as the Spanish flu. This looks like a newspaper clipping during the pandemic. Pastors are directed to see that all windows in churches are open. Congregations to wear wraps and coats in the churches. Ministers and priests to ask all sneezers and coughers to return home. Reduce congregational singing to the minimum. Services must not exceed 45 minutes. Ministers in sermons to point out the value of fresh air. Here's a church business card. The phone numbers were only six digits, starting with the exchange name. Phone numbers looked like this because of the telephone exchanges. These were the hubs through which an area's calls would be routed. Exchanges could only facilitate around 10,000 subscribers. Cities like Chicago had multiple hubs. Phone subscribers were given a unique four-digit number within their service area. Here's an announcement for a memorial service for the death of President Warren Harding, who died in office three days before this announcement. Starting in 1928, instead of handwriting all the announcements, they just glued the church bulletin in on a page for that given Sunday. These are lantern slide plates. These would have been viewed using a slide lantern like this to display the pictures on a wall or a screen. I don't own one of these lanterns, but we did get some pretty good images using an overhead projector. I also held these up on my computer monitor with a white background and got some pretty decent results as well. The first two images are storefronts that the congregation first met in. These workers were probably breaking ground for one of the new buildings. These are some of the first images of the church outside and inside. Other pictures in the boxes came from slides like these. Most of them were from the 1980s, but there were some very old ones, including this one which shows the interior construction of the first building in the year 1921. Before scanners were invented, somebody back then may have used a device like this. Insert the slide, close one eye, hold the viewer up to a light source, and you're gonna get a very good perspective of the image. There are a lot of documents. Nowadays we send email, but back then, letters were sent back and forth. These are two cent stamps on the letters. Here's an order for 70,000 bricks to build the church. These are estimates from the general contractor for plumbing, electrical, steel, plaster, and other costs. Here's a handwritten spreadsheet someone used to keep track of the costs. This is an interior blueprint for the organ and pews. Here's a furniture estimate including 30 pews at a cost of $5,100. Today, you could probably only buy one pew for $5,100. Here's the letter authorizing the installation of the new organ by the Wangerin Organ Company based out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Well, I barely scratched the surface in going through these seven boxes, but it's time to bring this video to a close. I hope you enjoyed this video. Probably not as much as I did, since I have a direct connection with Mount Olive Church, albeit 100 years after most of this stuff was written, but I still hope that you found it interesting to see how people live, what they can accomplish together when they put their minds to it, and how they pursued their faith. Thanks for watching, Alley Picked. Until next time, I'll meet you in the alley. We're gonna go on top of the bell tower, the very top on the outside. All right, get ready, this should be a good look.
from here, you can get a great view of the whole neighborhood. To the east, you can see a bit of the Chicago downtown skyline. Let me zoom in so you can see it better. So years ago, there used to be a cross right here. It used to light up and uh, you can see it throughout the whole neighborhood. 